Monica Han is a self-made, passionate serial entrepreneur creating business solutions in the industry she knows best, fashion. She is an innovative brand builder with multifaceted expertise in retail, marketing, strategy, business development, and consumer behavior. As the founder of Equal Hands, she oversees and nurtures all relationships with designers and artists and makers, assisting them to bring their legacy into the sphere of high fashion while ensuring the brand's ethos of sustainability is maintained. Prior to launching Equal Hands, Monica was the founder and CEO of Motobox, a digitally native online box service for women. She successfully sold Motobox to 12 Retech in 2020 in an exit that allowed her to focus on Equal Hands. Prior to that, Monica served as founder and creative director of women's apparel and accessories retailer, Lola Lisas. And during this time, she worked alongside talented fashion industry professionals while growing a 100 square foot shop nestled in New York's iconic limelight shops in a 4,000 square foot modern women's shopping haven. In her four years at the limelight, Monica also served as managing director and head buyer for men's clothing and apparel retailer um, at W Shops. Prior to Mona Lisa's, Monica spent three years at luxury fashion house Burberry as a men's ready-to-wear specialist and worked in general management at limited brands express stores. Monica has over 20 years of experience in retail and business management. She's constantly looking for new ventures and opportunities to grow her professional portfolio. As an activist for change in fashion, sustainability, and women's empowerment, Monica contributes her time and energy to multiple causes and nonprofits, including prevent traffic with education, um, edu educate a girl and save a mother's life. Please join me in welcoming Monica to the stage. Hi everyone. 20 years sounds like I'm really old. I right? know. <laughs> I'm right there, buddy. Don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us today. Um, so I kind of want to go a little bit more chronologically and wondering about the start of your career. Um, you know, where and when did you study and, and how did you get going? Well, um, everything was just very, for me, unfortunately, and fortunately, was in a different path. Um, my parents are refugee from Southeast Asia and they end up in Argentina. And I was born and raised in Argentina. so. Growing up with refugee parents in, in a camp, I didn't really have an opportunity to like study, unfortunately. I just had to choose one or the other, <laughs> or just one of another. Yeah. So I started to work at a very young age uh, in retail. I uh, started at 15 in a sweater shop in Argentina. Ah, yeah, that was my career. So you guys are very, very fortunate and lucky to be here and be able to <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And um, so, how did you take that and get to where you are today? <laughs> well, so working in retail, I think, have taught me, you know, from very beginning stages of like also production and how to appreciate the garments and how to learn about where it starts from an, a threat to like the end consumer and even what it ends after the consumer. So all of that, it kind of educated me to understand more about fashion, and it took me many, many years to, um, to learn that part, um, sustainability, the sustainability part of fashion, and that's how I guess I end up here, but long story, sh uh, I'll make it the long part or the short part. Um, working in retail for, since I was 15, I came to America when I was 17, and at the beginning, I worked in a lot of different things from uh, wrapping chocolates in a factory, to like cleaning, to like whatever that I could, get my you know work on and um, I started I, I went to uh, the limited express store which is from the limited brand and I started as a reader just by you I'm sure you guys been to the store where somebody stand on the door and it's like hi how are you today welcome to express that was my job all day <laughs> um, but I was a little bit more friendly than a lot of readers, so I will assist the customers, and the, my, my manager saw that point, and then they rely on me on, on sales a lot, and they saw my numbers, and they, they decided to promote me at the age of like 20 to become the manager of the store, uh -huh. and at that time the store was doing uh, 5 million in revenue, and we have like 20 people in staff. So for me, it was like, wow, like, I'm in America, I didn't go to school, I don't have formal education, my English is still broken, but like, I get to like, experience the business side of retail. Wow. 
That's awesome. And yeah, from there I learned everything from UBC to uh, sale points to cr opening credit cards. So like anything you can imagine of running a business in that capacity and also scheduling and you know how to motivate the staff, the team, train them and all of that stuff. So I'm very grateful obviously for that opportunity in that window. And I stayed there for five years and when I came to New York, I landed up, I, I basically walked up and down Fifth Avenue and I was so like glammed by like all the luxury houses and I wanted to like work in one of the luxury houses and Burberry should not be one of them. And yes, I spent close to six years there and one day I was just standing there and I was just like, well, like, is this it? If this is where I want to end, like what I really want to do. I was questioning a lot about my career, so it was an accident becoming an entrepreneur. Um, on 28th Street back then, it was a wholesale district where they sell jewelry. And so I just went to the wholesale uh, jewelry, the chart, the, to buy jewelry wholesale and start selling it in the uh, street fair in the market. Oh. And this is like maybe 15 years ago. Um, and that afternoon, I sold $700. And I remember my paycheck being $700 <laughs> for the week. <laughs> so I was like, what I'm doing? So, you know, like, why? Like, I can make and do the things that I like, which is like involved in sale and retail and all of that stuff. <coughs> and so, and curate my own jewelry. So that's how I started to become an entrepreneur. Wow. And it trickled to like everything that's today. That's great. Are you still doing anything like that that you're making on your own? Uh, I work with the artisans a lot in product development. Uh, we use a lot of their techniques and their like what they know from many many years to tweak it a little bit into a different market um, if we can. So I do work on, on that area. Uh huh. That's really great. Um. So there. What? Uh, your mission <laughs> statement. Your mission statement. I'm sorry. Is our three pillars of sustainability that serve our strength are people, planet, and progress. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose this mission? Well, so people is the social uh, pillar, and um, planet it's about our environment, and in progress it's about economic. So I dabble a lot into what kind of company I wanted to be part of, or what I wanted to create, and how would that impact others, besides just a transaction of selling clothes or being in the fashion industry. And one of the things that happened throughout my traveling is that um, I was in a very remote remote area in, in Southeast Asia. And I, I had very little left money with me, very little cash, and a bunch of kids came running, selling stuff to me, like souvenir, bracelet, and I bought one, and then 20 more came, and then I was like, I don't have any more. And, and I felt so powerless, because the kids, uh, it was a monastery, and I was walking down the step, and they followed me all the way down, and they keep following me for more, and I didn't have any more, and one, and like, the, one of the kids was like, please, please, I walked so far away, and I, ha I haven't eaten today, and I, I, I really, like, your, whatever you buy will really help me tonight. And I just like tear. I was just like, what? Like, it, it reminded a lot of like what I had gone through as a child in a refugee camp and growing up in Argentina. My afternoon, I would sell dolls to tourists in town. And I guess at that point, for the tourists, it was just a simple souvenir that they wanted to take home. But for me, that purchase was so much. It meant like what I was going to eat that afternoon. It's the same thing for that child. And here I am in America buying my $5 Starbucks <laughs> and not be able to do anything about it. So that day I, I thought a lot about it. I came home and I said, what, what do I know? What I'm good at? How am I going to be able to like channel my energy to like help uh, others that are in an unfortunate situation? And I was like, I'm good at retail, fashion, garment, or whatever, all of this. It, ha it has to be a way for for me to create something that's good, that's gonna work, and throughout the process, like you know, when you travel overseas, you're always shopping, you're always going to the market, you're always meeting artisans, you're always seeing them making things, and that's where I was like, okay, well, how can we make these things and sell them in America or in anywhere in the world? You know, not only in America. Yeah, yeah. So did I answer that question? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, definitely. I think you did. Um, I mean, you, yeah. where you came up with the idea for this specific? Company. So 
So the first part is it's the social the social pillar, which is how can we be more social in everything that we do in terms of um, creating a way that we can uh, help the artisans or help the community and show them that they can break the cycle of the two dollars a day and they can do better if we work as a team to somehow show their product to all, to and have access to all the point of sales. And the environmental part, it came truly, you know, I discovered very late in life the uh, documentary, The True Cost of Fashion. Mm -hmm. And it really broke my heart in many ways, not also for the people, not only for the planet. Yeah. And I work in fashion. I mean, I will be the girl that will go to Sarah because I want the latest fashion, you know, because Sarah knocked off something from the runway and I couldn't really afford the runway. But after I learned so much about it, I was like, how could I, how could we do this? How could we could continue to do this to our planet if we, like, we, we're, the end consumer is the person that has the power to say yes or no to what's happening to our environment. Yeah. And so I wanted to practice that as well with everything that we do. We didn't want to, we don't want to mass produce. We don't want to use, um, dangers or chemical dye or anything that's going to harm our, our, our environment and avoid a lot of plastics and things like that. And then uh, the economic is it's, it's trying to create that bridge that we say it's about, you know, we, I always talk to, to, to my team, like it's not about teaching, it's not about giving them fish, it's about teaching how to, how to fish. So it's not about going to the artisan and make a purchase or make like for one week and then never come back or give them hope or anything like that. You know, it's about how we can create this channel that can consistently move so that you know the, the economy and their and their hometown and their community can grow because they are the ones sending the kids to school and you know they're, they're the artisans. Most of the artisans are female, female, and they're the head of household. Yeah. So that's why the three pillars. <laughs> so awesome. So how did you get it started? Once you you had this idea, you're traveling. You, you this little boy, and how did you take it from there? Well, so the, tr the, the aha moment came maybe two years before I started. I think it was in the back of my head of thinking, I really want to do this, I really want to do this. But you know, we're the kind of people that have this voice that we want to do it, but we don't really do it. So I think it happened to me is when COVID, COVID hit, I was, I was at home crying because I was reading the news about people dying. So I was like, okay, so if I don't do this now, whenever it's gonna happen, like the world is turning upside down, everything is just like, we don't even know what's gonna happen. So if I don't start placing order to this artisan that live like in a remote area without cell phone, without access to food, without access to things, if, if the first world is suffering from COVID, can you imagine like what's happening with the other parts of the world? So if I don't do this now, when am I gonna do it? So COVID like pushed me to do it, and it was two years after I had my aha moment. And because of COVID, I have a lot of time in my hand to sit on the computer and do research and to contact all of these artists, I contact the people, the network, everybody that I contact, they will, they will react to it because it was so slow that people had the time to connect with you. And now the messages are very, are very meaningful and very connected because we as a human are talking to each other differently than it was pre-COVID. Yeah, wow. That's great, and but so the, the network of people that you would talk to, like, how do they, how do they kind of? It's a combination over the years. I mean, I had when I had my boutique um, in the limelight, I would curate different emerging brands and designers, and my focus was never about sustainability at that time. My focus was about finding cool designers. So I had particularly these two designers. Um, they are partners, and they would do phenomenal work, work and they're based in Colombia, and all the all the technique that they use and the things they will do and it was all about uh, working with the artisan and also about promoting sustainability and I didn't know that to, like I but then now I'm trying to build the brand that is about sustainability so then I reach out to them you know and things like that and all of us start to go like that's just one person out of the, all the connections that we have made throughout the years yeah oh, that's really great and um, rewinding this slightly, in your bio, you talk about the company that you, that you sold in 2020. Can you tell us about what that was about and, and how you went about getting Yeah, <laughs> so um, working at Burberry, I, uh, it, it, we would work a lot, very personalized experience with the clients. 
um, a woman will come in or men will come in into our store and they will get five star treatment because it was a luxury store. You know, it was we know everything about a person and then I was like, well, how come the normal person that goes to the regular store doesn't get a luxury experience? Like, that's not fair. You know, like, I mean, I want to spend a hundred bucks, but I still want to feel good. Um, but I was like, I, from in, I had the store, so it was really impossible for me to create that experience because we need a lot of manpower. So I say, what if I knew so much about these clients, this person, so I can serve them better? So it's about learning about who they were. So we created this da uh, data, this uh, technology where you come in and you take a quiz, and on the quiz it will be fun. But like we will take so much information from you, from literally not what you eat, but <laughs> like your color, your favorite colors, your size, your weight, like everything, so much. So then by the time we were ready to serve serve you, we had so much information sit on the on our data, on your profile. So basically, they'll come in, they'll build a profile, and then they will tell us the location of what they're shopping for, and we will curate a box full of fun clothing that were not sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> um, and ship it to the customer, the customer will try it at home, and whatever they like, they keep it, whatever they like, they need like to ship, they can ship it back. So they have that special feeling of uh, talking to our salad uh, digitally, and also knowing that that box was personalized and curated for them. So the company turned out to be very data-driven. Data we have a lot of information. So to our retech, it's about retail and technology. So they were like, we want this information. And they never really continued to run the business after they took it over. And I assume it was in early 2020? Yeah. So you got really lucky. <laughs> yeah, it's, it happened right yeah, with right all of that. that it, it, exactly. It's, it's about, it was about timing. Yeah. But I was very... I think like maybe some of the students will ask today about like Korea and everything. I think at that point I was very burned out with this business. Yeah. Uh, because I felt that a lot of our customer were 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 have were having problems with what they wanted, but I didn't want to solve the customer problem anymore. I want to solve the artisan problem or the designer problem or my brand's problem. Right. And I think that's why I shifted to a model where my focus is mainly in the other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on the other side of the spectrum. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's great. Um, what have you found to be the hardest part about this whole thing? <laughs> oh, I mean, I think as a business, as an entrepreneur, you things change fast. For example, our Instagram got, got hacked twice since we started. I mean, our first Instagram had 15,000 followers, we did really well, and then it got hacked. And then our second one, it was three months in, it got hacked again. And now we have a new account that has six posts, and it, it looks like we are not like, what is this business? They have six, I mean, 100 followers. Like, it doesn't put us into the cred credibility that we would like to be because we know that we had built something before. But things like that happen. I mean, Google update the iOS, or like something happened with the technology, or like updates happen in technology. Like, all the time, like almost every other day. And when that happened, you lose a lot of the stuff that you already built. And it's really hard to like, kind of, you know, have to start over and follow the trend, follow what's happening, you know, with yeah. technology. Yeah, that makes sense. What do you feel like is the best part about? About, uh, you know, that, that, yeah, uh, being an entrepreneur, <laughs> but also the, your, your mission in particular. Um, the best part is knowing that I, I can't change the world and I can't change it, like, a lot of you know people struggle every like a lot of places and I can't change all of that but uh, the most rewarding part is that maybe it's just one family at a time this is yeah. one thing you can change exactly yeah. I know that um, my Addison Ketty this month you know had made enough you know for to cover for six months of her living and her children to go to school and not have to worry not have to struggle and that's really rewarding and it was not a lot from us to do in our end, you know, like it's just so litter. It's like, it's like a cup of coffee is five dollars here, and then you can buy a bag of rice, and it will last them a week. And it it it, make, it means so much to the person, to the other side. Mm -hmm. So that's what is rewarding. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So once you got going, you have this amazing idea and this. Um, admirable idea. How have you gotten the word out? You know, what have you done to to get the first sale? There's no friends and family. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I don't know how that happened. I can't even remember the first sale that it was. Uh, yeah, the first sale was definitely not friends and family. Um, 
every business takes time, okay. you know, it, it doesn't, it, overnight sensation happen when you get fully funded by like major institution or VC or yeah. private investor. Everything else that you grow organically, it's gonna take a little bit of time. And I think for me, when I decided on this business, I was gonna make it about the people first before profit. Mm -hmm. And not everybody is gonna build that type of business. But for us, we agree that like, it has nothing to do with the profit that we make. It has to do with the platform that we're building in order to make this work. Yeah. And um, it happened organically, I guess. Uh, you know, we're, we, we're, we're in so many different stores in the US now that I don't, I don't, I should put the list up on the website. Oh. But I guess it's been, I haven't been having time. But yeah, we are like in stores, so it's, it's oh, just I didn't realize that. Oh yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah. So you, so how much your business is being wholesale and how much is from, from your own site? Well, that's the funny part. I never intended to be wholesale. I never, we didn't want to kill the artist fund. Like meaning like, I don't, like here's a hundred pack, make it now because if you don't make it now, I'm going to yeah. lose the sale, you know? Yeah. Like, and the margin is so low because we're selling at a wholesale. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was never intended to be that way. I guess our first Big Wholesale, it was a collaboration from a brand from Sweden. Um, they are all about sustainability and they want to collaborate, they want to do a collaboration with us at that time and we decided, um, you know, in, in, in your business there's so many battles that you have to fight and you have to choose which one you want to, you want to choose and at that time we decided that it would be, we'd be better off helping them to do a private label. So they could have their own brand using our technique and some of our input and our design and work together as a partner. So Eco Hand brand was never going to be on their handbag. It's not it. It's more like we're behind the scene. Yeah. And this way, you know, we'll create uh, our work for the artists that are flowing like all year round. Uh -huh. um, so we never intended to be that way, but it happens. And even you know, for the we discovered this platform called Fairy, which is like uh, they host uh, sustainable brands. And we were like, oh, let's just give it a try. And then as soon as we were try, we start getting orders and things are happening. And the wholesale has been moving a little bit faster than the direct consumer because, you know, like, I think with direct consumer, you constantly have to promote in social media and you constantly have to do like heavily marketing online and things like that. But with wholesale, it's like the boutique owner they are the curator, so they are the one looking for a certain type of product to curate in the store. Yeah. So it's less of a marketing for us. Yeah. Um, than doing wholesale business. Yeah. Oh, so interesting. Wow. Um, so how many people are currently working on your team? You so a small team of four. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. amazing, though. Yeah. It's um, one of the things too that you know, from my previous business. <laughs> if, if you want to ask me the lesson I learned. Uh, I always had a staff of like between 15 and 20 and it was really necessary in a lot of things yeah. and I think that like now that I'm a veteran I like to believe of being so long in the industry and having like built through business I I learned how to be more lean <laughs> <laughs> that's great well I mean and your site looks so amazing too so thank you where's your been your favorite place to go travel wise for looking for not I guess two questions. For work. <laughs> First, looking for craft, you know, mm -hmm. not craft, artisan um, work. And second would be just, you know, for inspiration, things like that. I think one of my favorite places, it has been Morocco. Um, when you step in certain area, it's like everything is back into like 500 years ago. Everything is still, there's no machinery. Like, the, like if you go to China, you're like machine, machine, machine. Right? But in Morocco, it's like everything is hand. Like mm -hmm. hammering hand, everything they do welding, um, you, they use raffia, it, like they dye, everything is hand, wow. still humanized. And it takes you back to, to a moment where you're like, I didn't know this exists because we leave, like if we live in New York, everything is cars. And, yeah. You know, there's some part of the town that there's not even car, like allowed. Mm -hmm. there's, yeah, so it, I think that's probably like one of my favorite places. So like also, it's very vibrant. Mm -hmm. um, it's very colorful, colorful but tasteful. Yeah. Tastefully, like if you see the tiling and work and everything, it's just gorgeous, and the food and everything. Yeah. <laughs> but um, my most stronger artisans that we do really well are from Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. uh, from Latin America, and from India. Oh, wow. okay. And best selling item for you? Um, it's in between Colombia and India. Uh -huh. uh, 
So we have a group of artisans that work with hand carving wood. So if you go to the Bax collection and you go to India, you'll see, um, but they're a little bit more um, evening wear. Oh. So when COVID happened, my husband was like, who's going to buy those bags? <laughs> he was like, no. And I was like, let me be the curator of this. Trust me. Yeah. They'll come back. And no. And people, will, people are dying to go out and do it. But he was like, nobody's doing <coughs> them anywhere. Those yeah. bags are not going to work. He was, um, and then we have an artist in Colombia that works with Iraqa Palm. And people like it because it's just so unique and different. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have a few capstone questions for the class, but I'm, I'm scattering them a little bit this week. I'm wondering what your biggest failure has taught you. Oh, okay. So back to my store at the Lab Light, and when I told you, like, this is when I have like maybe 15 people in payroll, and my burn rate was way more than what I was selling monthly. Well, actually, it was exactly the same. So when that happened, you don't have a business. You're like, you make a mistake for like two months, and you're done. Yeah, and do I do understand what she means by the oh, term burn rate. It's like what her expenses were to run the shop, you know, pay the rent, pay the to uh, run the business, to run the business. Yeah, so like I had payroll, pay the entire staff, I have to pay the rent of the store, I have to pay for the merchandise that was sold. All of that was higher than the sale number that I had in the store, almost the same or higher. And we went. Hurricane Sandy at the time mm -hmm. happened, mm -hmm. so we went three months without like getting more sales so like I was already in debt and it was heavy because I was I was young and I was I think came with a formal education so nobody really walked me through like a, a spread a PL <laughs> a loss in profit sheet so to me it was like I don't know I was at that time I was the first few first female entrepreneur in the US that hit a million in revenue. And I, and I didn't even know how many zeros in a million because I came from like a different world. So like I never had like that education where somebody sat with me and said, here's a, a loss and profit sheet and here's what you're selling and here's what you're spending and here's what's happening. So that was never thought to me. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was a very expensive mistake and when you asked me where I went to school, that was my story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a trial by fire. That's yeah, it was a very expensive, yeah. Yeah. What are you most proud of in your career so far? The flip side of that. Um, everything I've learned. You know, I think that I think life has give you a very hard time, so you can learn from that. And I think that for for everything that I did wrong, something came out of. And I'm proud of of, of being patient enough. And, and, and be able to observe all of those bad things that happened to me, but all of the things, rather than be like, oh, you're such a loser, you're, not, you're never gonna make it as an entrepreneur again, why start another business, you're gonna fail, you know, all of those things, I'm glad that I didn't let that take me, and, and I'm proud of being that person. Yeah, oh, I love that. Um, who's the most interesting person you've met in your career? Oh my God, I met too many. <laughs> uh, one of the beautiful part about being a female entrepreneur, there's so many other female entrepreneurs that are trying to do great things in the world as well, in different departments, in different area. And I think I have met so many like people like me that's just trying to make a difference. And I take a little bit of everybody. And I think everybody has an interesting story to share. And I can't say one single person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot along the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think every, I think I have met a lot. Of, I will be sitting here and, and going through twenty people. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what part of Argentina did you grow up in? In Misiones, oh. which is the north. Okay. Um, and do you do you still go back? I do. Yeah, I do go back. Um, yeah. So we're going through a process of war right now, and as you see, a lot of. Uh, Refugees tried to read asylum, and my family raised their hand and they said, We want to go to Argentina. <laughs> so they went to Argentina, and unfortunately, the language was just so different, and we didn't have a lot of support system. So it was really hard to get out of like the same whole you know, situation that we were for many years. Um, yeah. Wow. But I go back, and my dad's still there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, it's amazing. Um, did you ever, you know, when you were getting started, did you ever have to lean on your network to move yourself forward? Or? 
you always have to lean on somebody, right? Absolutely. You don't do any, everything yourself. Um, it takes a village to build a village, you know. And we always have this philosophy where, like, you, you need you need an army to, to, to do whatever that you wanted to do. And I was lucky enough, uh, and this is mainly through networking and entrepreneur forums or going to events, conferences, and meet people. Yeah. And it's it's always you you always have to in even as an entrepreneur it's lonely it can get very very lonely you see your friends that who are not doing what you're doing and then you come talk to them and sometimes they're like i don't get what you're trying to tell me <laughs> you know i'm gonna go to my nine to five job and this is i want like what do you mean you have a headache what do you mean like it's just and it can, it can get very lonely so i do lean on a lot of my fellow entrepreneurs yeah yeah um, so, what what would your biggest piece of advice be to students who are wanting to launch their own uh, business? To be patient and also just also just do it. A lot of a lot of people, including me, we want things to be perfect. We want things to be so crispy and exactly the way we want it, and then we don't get to do it, and then we procrastinate. So if you have an idea and you want to do something, just do it, and you will you will pivot and you will change and you will grow as you do it, rather than wait and not do it and wait for the perfect moment because it's never it's never going to be a perfect time. It's never going to be a perfect business. It's always going to be a learning curve. Yeah. So just do it. Yeah. <laughs> just do it. Like as Nike says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, another question from the class is, and if you have people who all want to be unique in hiring, what has caught you or I to set someone apart uh, to be hired? Well, it's funny because last week I interviewed 16 people <laughs> and I was like, God, please don't be, don't do this again, don't do this again. So, you know, like hiring and going to work and, and, and be part of the company, it's like, it's two-way street. It's two-way street, right? It's not only taking in and right. But at the beginning, when the company's looking to hire somebody, they're paying you for them so they wanted to know what you're gonna do for them and when and my first question goes what made you apply for this particular opening and the answer will be like well because and then they go about themselves and then they never read anything about the company or you know and like for for the hiring it's like well I'm gonna pay this person and although they can be part of my team and my family and grow my business I would like to know that like if the interest is also helping me grow <coughs> Um, right. They're themselves, so I know that you're looking to grow, but just make sure you care. Like, uh, learn about the company who you're gonna interview with, know about who they are, and then so you go with like a, with a lot of information, like with a, a full loaded gun to <laughs> shoot, like, and they will be very impressed. And I think that you know, like the whole answer, like, like I, it happens to me, like for three or four people, and I was just very disappointed. Yeah, you know that they made mm -hmm. it about themselves. <laughs> totally about themselves. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like uh, one of the so they're like, oh, because I love marketing, because I love this and like that, but like they knew nothing about like what I was looking for. So yeah, yeah, that's a big red flag. Yeah, so <laughs> do a little bit for research about the company yeah. before you interview for sure. <laughs> Especially one I feel like as unique as yours because it, it, any company, I mean, just you know, I, work, I used to work at Burberry and. They will, it's funny because we've been through the process where somebody will come in with a resume and we like look at them up and down. And not because we're looking at you up and down to judge you, it's because we want to see if you belong, the brand, you belong and you can become part of the brand. Like, and that's what they, we look for, right? Can this person think <coughs> the way I think or think like me? Can this person, uh, you know, feel the same way I feel about certain things and, and, and that's how it is to build a, a group, a team, and friends, and everything that you do, you're like, want to relate to. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Now I'm wondering, did you, when you started the business in 2020, did you start with just one category of big business and add on, or did you start? I made the all? mistake that everybody does. I, I thought it was so funny. So funny Too much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to be a company where it's a destination to find find everything. And as we, we when year one in the business, it, our clothing was a bigger failure. 
because we don't, like I mentioned, we don't mass produce a lot of our things are one at a time. Sometimes we use upcycle pieces. And the, you can't, the, it's, as a consumer, you go into a feeding room into the store, and you can't even guarantee that the stuff is going to fit you, let alone buy online. Right. So we had a lot of um, challenges in terms of, especially because they were made to order. So a client will order two dresses, and they were made for her. So that means she should fit her, and she should keep it. <laughs> right. But you know, sometimes it happens. The, our designers will, are working with a different um, tech pack that's the, in sizing in a different country that it doesn't really Trans get translated to the sizing in the US. You know, so things like that will happen. So it was very, very challenging. And obviously, it's something that I learned throughout the process that I, I was like, well, we don't have to produce clothes. We're going to just make it as a go. And it turned out to be kind of a little bit of a, a hit. Yeah, a miss. Sorry, a miss, a miss, a miss. Yeah. How quickly did you have to get out of it? Uh, we removed ninety percent of our inventory out of the website. Oh wow. yeah. So that's why it's a little bit a lot of accessories. Yeah. <laughs> you don't see the clothing tab anymore. Yeah. Um, we had to cancel orders and explain to the customer. Uh, it was not up to standard what we were offering. So I, you know, you have to be very yeah. You have to be honest. Yeah. You have to be honest. With yourself and with the customers, that like if you don't feel good selling this, don't you know? I, I felt terrible. I mean, I remember we were wrapping this beautiful five hundred dollar dress, and I was like, it's just wrong. This is off. Like it, this seam seam wasn't perfect. Um, the dress was made in a, in a country that they didn't have as a high quality standard as the U.S. Mm -hmm. They thought it was fine, perfect, but I I didn't prototype. So at that time, I wasn't prototyping the clothes either. Uh, you know, like. For the accessory, I will prototype them. I will get samples. I will approve. Yeah. But for the clothing, we partner up with the designer, and we just sold. Um, we're not only produce our product. We also partner with brands and designers from different parts of the world that they already have the brand. So we partner up with this designer. They already have the brand, and the product wasn't really. Yeah. So I had to remove a lot of our clothing. <coughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's painful. Yeah, it's a lot of work. But. And what did you do to get? Rid of product, or did you not have it in inventory? We didn't have it in inventory. Okay, so they, they, yeah, they were made to order. They, we will use their collection from the runway to oh. for, to photograph the the product. We were listed online, and when it gets ordered, is when we will produce uh, the product. Okay. So we never really we we lost a lot of time in photography and uh, copywriting and uploading to the website. All of that takes time and somebody to do it and all of that. So we lost that and also a, a, a promotion assets and you know the, the, the language that we want to communicate to our consumers or what we're doing and things like that. So yeah. You have to shift and as I mentioned earlier, uh, when you start just do it and then learn from it and then try to change as you go. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> um, Another question that I have from the class is if you had the chance to talk to yourself just starting out, what advice would you give yourself? Um, learn the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> learn, I mean, if I knew a little bit more about finances, I would have been in a different place. And I think that like, I guess I was young, ambitious, and it was just <coughs> new to me, and I was very aggressive with yeah. You know, with growth, I was very aggressive. Like, let's grow, let's grow. We're doing great, we're doing great. But in reality, we're not doing great because we're spending time to grow. Uh -huh. And I think that, like, I, I don't know. I guess that's just that's why I'm so lean now. Yeah, <laughs> smart. I became stingy now. Yeah, it's smart to be lean. I think it's really smart. Um. Well, great. I'll, I'll turn it over for now to the students for some questions. Hi. Hello. Hi. Where are you going to find them? Yeah, like where do you even start to find them? Uh, a lot of the artisans that we work with are in very remote areas. And so my background, it's, um, I grew up in a Latin American country. So luckily I, be able, I speak the language. So it's been easy like finding threads of like litter here and there. And then when I travel, I said, I want to take a tour. I'm going to give you an example. Um, we went to Turkey. 
and we made the effort to say, find where's the village where they make carpets, and how can we get to that village? So we will be like, take our, uh, our part of our trip just to do that, and then go to the village and meet the artisans, and you know, and sometimes you can take different tours to meet them, like not go on your own and things like that. Um, it's a combination of that. It's a combination of some of the designers that I already work with, they work with different techniques. And it's a combination of always give something to someone that needs at a time in my career. I feel that like I built enough credibility where I can call such and such for a favor. So even if I didn't have the artisan, I'd be like, oh, you in Mexico? I heard that this hiki hapa hat is made in Mexico in the cave and they use this. Could you please find out what are the group of ladies or what are the group of um, cooperative? Because sometimes they have cooperative. Um, for me, give me the information and things like that. So that's how I find them, just throughout like a lot of research and work. That was one question. Yeah. The other question, how do I give myself credit really to the artisans? So believe it or not, like in a lot of parts of the world, they just want to work. They just want the product to be showing outside of their market. Like if you go to Peru, we go. We went to this cooperative that they work with llama, with baby llama. But I learned what baby llama means, by the way. It's not a baby llama. It's, it's the first shape of the, of the llama. Um, and they make these beautiful sweaters, right? And, it, and Sunday comes, they go to the market, and they sell it to like the tourists and the people in the market. They would die for the opportunity to say, let me take this to my, you know, and, and, and they don't, they're so used to of like, of like somebody come to them and, and not promise them a future. Like that's their life every day. And so they're not saying like, oh, you, you are never gonna do business with me. I'm not gonna give you my sample or I'm not gonna give you. They're like, fine, take it, see how it goes. Call me if you, if something comes out or don't call me if it doesn't come out. So they're very open for that, believe it or not. Like I was, so, I mean, not surprised, but I kind of knew that they were not going to be resistant of doing business with you, even if they didn't know you well, but they know you. Yeah. But, you know, make sure you build a website, have a business card, right. have an Instagram account, have something to show them, right? Not just a piece of paper and, yeah. you know, have something. Do you only work in countries where you know or you speak the language? I try, so I try to develop a product from Thailand, and I'm from Laos, and I speak Laotian. And I still have hard time, by the way. That yeah. product has been two years that I haven't been able to develop it because of the language barrier. Oh. Um, I mean, I try to, to go to places where I could communicate with them. And like for Morocco, they speak French and English. So it's completely fine. Like I'm working right now with a series of different artisans and they do speak the language. Oh, that's great. Also, the other thing that's really helpful that I used to have is, um, or I have some time in different country, you have, um, it's called a production manager. So the person is in the country um, and it goes and oversee the production of, and it's not expensive because, like we talked about it earlier, like in Thailand, you know, it cost me $400 to pay someone to work with me full time. And that's a lot of money for them. But for me, it's like, that's a budget. Like it's, it's, it's a budget for somebody to oversee the product and the quality control, to make sure that before they ship the product, she goes to the village, checks everything is right, she sends me photo, or she, if I say there's any correction, can you do that for me, and things like that. So that's another route too, that sometime I go, if I know that that year I'm gonna do certain product category. But there are places that I already been myself, and I already went to the village and talked to the artist and have a relationship, so it's, it's it, it varies. Are you ever, have you ever had an issue with not receiving the goods that oh, yeah. you Yeah. <laughs> Once, I eventually received the good, but it was really boring me. And I, I unfortunately, I, something in my heart that didn't believe, believe her. Yeah. She said she got robbed and the money that I gave her was gone. So I was like, and that's the other thing, right? Um, so we try to pay in advance because we know that they don't have the funding to go buy the material. Mm -hmm. So if they have to buy the thread or they have to order like the palms or like anything, they need funding, a little bit of money. So I don't know what I was thinking that day, but I pay her full for everything. I, I don't know. I Sometimes I do it because, I, and I met her in person. I, I met her already once. And I know where she lived too. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I figure, well, she's not going anywhere, but I'm not going to a village that anytime soon either. But it took like a long time to get the product. 
So she, she, the three months passed by and the product wasn't produced and I keep checking with her and then she finally break down and say, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Somebody broke into my house and took all the cash. And it's a, it was a lot of cash for where she was. But I'm gonna find a solution. I've been doing other job and I've been taking the little cash here and there to fulfill your order. And I, I was disappointed and I didn't know what to believe. But yeah. eventually the product came. So you kind of have to believe that she was... I, I mean, I don't... Now, when we do business, I have to pay her only half. Yeah, you know? oh, but you still do business with her. That's I have an order again from her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that you're like, oh, like, well, maybe, I want to do good, but I don't know what happened here. But she ended up sending, pro she ended up sending me the product. Um, it wasn't as up to standard as I wish it was because when we met in person, we went over everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it just, it happens, you know, it happens. You just have to, I think one of the things that I would do, I mean, with new vendors is just to pay half, you know, or even 25%. But half is fair enough so they can, they can have access right. to move around and move. Yeah. Sometimes they don't even have like the kneading, they don't have the wooden thing, so they have to buy it or they yeah. don't have the tread or they have to get it, you know. So you, you have to help somehow. But once you build a relationship, you know, I I go ahead and pay up front. And one of my artisans, for example, she doesn't need the money as far as much as others, so she just mm -hmm. does the production and 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 send me the invoice when she's ready to ship, you know. So it's all different different for everybody. Yeah. If um, how it's kind of complicated that you work with so many different small vendors. How do you get it here? Is it do you consolidate it all? We try to consolidate. Yeah. It takes forever. Yeah. Um, we try to consolidate. It takes forever. And at the beginning, when we launched, we decided not to carry inventory, like zero inventory, and it was all going to be made to order. But the wholesale business started picking up, so we started to consolidate a little bit. We uh -huh. started to say, okay, we're going to get order in certain category let's get extra for the website, you know, so we have it. Um, and so it's been like that, and we do, when you ship in between country, it's really, really inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Like, it's nothing. It's like, to ship up here, Aaron, it's like $4, versus in here, it's like $20. You yeah. Know? So like, sometimes I combine the designers, and I say, okay, can you combine them? But sometimes the sales don't happen simultaneously. Yeah. So we would just have to take on the shipping. So you have to kind of work it out. I mean, we're... I like to believe that we're still in stages that we're learning, and uh -huh. I like to believe that as everything grows, we're trying to, you know, do as much as we can to reduce shipping because obviously it's not going to print too. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So, other than the financial aspect, um, if you could start start over, like, what other steps would you take, like, to prepare? Like, what would you do differently? Like, starting over? Um. Let's see. I guess hire better. I guess one of the biggest, one of my biggest failure too. I hire, um, I hire somebody that I to become my store manager, and we became so close because he was running my business, and at the end he was taking from my from me. I know. So hire better. Yeah. And that's why I got burned out. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, trust. At what point in your business did you like start getting involved in like philanthropy? Like how can like we get like involved in that too, even though like, we don't necessarily have like a lot of money to be donating. So uh, the first part, I didn't hear the, the what part of my business. Did yeah, like at what point did you think it was like okay for you to start getting involved in like your philanthropic like efforts? Like I know you like mentioned the like three yes. in bio. Yes. Like when did you start getting involved in that? Um, so I have a friend that uh, basically he created a platform that made it easy for us to make donations mm -hmm. and uh, they can integrate with the website. So we didn't went to the, to the nonprofit organization and vetted them. The company already vetted them, so mm -hmm. it made it easy for us to do the transaction. So our donation is for every transaction that's made, we don't we don't ask the customer. Don't you know like when you go to do a they're like, do yeah. you want to round it up? Yeah. No, we don't do that. We just say pick what organization you want to donate, and the money's coming from us. Okay. So that's how we do it, and it's you know it's anywhere from one dollar to five dollar, and um, like I say, you know sometimes it's not like you can change the world, do so much, but just litter it adds up, you know. Mm -hmm. Did that answer yeah. your question? Yeah. Okay. 
And he built a platform that was so easy for us to integrate that I didn't have to go because initially we wanted to pick uh, our own um, nonprofit, mm -hmm. but it was it was going to be a lot of work because you have to do a lot of due diligence yeah. and things like that. So he already had vetted nonprofits. Oh, yeah. Right here. Okay, so um, I was wondering, um, what do you think are the biggest mistakes that young new entre entrepreneurs tend to make and how we could avoid that? What is it, Kira Hero? You said what's it called? That, that sentence when you when you when you have a big head. Oh, Kira Hero, you said. Oh, you don't be too far ahead of yourself. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Is that right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if generation is it's it's different when we say young entrepreneur and entrepreneur. I think that like now I look at the twenties and thirties. It's so different, you know? We all have to work really, really hard, and I think the world of social media have changed that. Um, an influencer will come and post something, and then you look at it, and you're like, well, why can I do that? It, it, it's, we don't know what's behind that influencer life. So don't, like what I would say, is don't think that it's not gonna be a hard road. Like, be prepared to sacrifice a lot in order to make it work. I mean, there were times when I first launched my business, 20 bucks came in and it was a Friday night, all my friends were out drinking and I'm, I'm packing inventory to put it in the store because I knew that tomorrow was Saturday and I had I had to have products on the sales floor, otherwise I wasn't gonna have a good Saturday sale day. And I was, uh, you know, literally doing it myself till 2 a.m. or things like that. Like, you just have to be prepared to sacrifice those things. And I'm sure you guys as a student do that when you're like, I have an exam, don't call me. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's, entrepreneurship is, is a lot like that. You have to sacrifice a lot. Um, weekends and times and everything. So just be prepared for that. Okay, thank you. How did you first get affiliated with FIT or, you know, connected with FIT? Uh, I think <laughs> Sorry, no, many years ago I yeah. came, I did a speaking before a couple times. Ah, yeah. And I think because of my story of being like the I mean, we're talking about 10, 15 years ago with like the first female making the revenue, you know. Now a lot of, tons of company are making over a million in revenue. By that time it was just so fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So, and part of that, part of my story, and I don't know, I came to speak once and then they invited me to recruit students and they invited, and then we just been part of it. That's yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, we all appreciate it. But it, I, it is interesting, you mentioned the movie True Cost, yes. and every time I have someone in for sustainability, it's very much focused on the planet yes. and yes. not so much on the people mm -hmm. aspect. So back to sustainability, it's not, sustainability is not just about one thing, it's not about like, oh let me stop using plastic straw, or let me start, uh, you know, collecting my garbage differently, or let me stop, it's, it's sustainability, it's about people progress, and you know, it's about economical, about, about social, because it's about being sustainable, you yeah. know, so, yeah. But I think the young lady has a question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes. um, so, was there ever an environment in like a workplace or any type of job where you weren't taken seriously for whatever reason, and if so, how did you handle it? Yeah, it happens. I mean, I shouldn't call them out who they were, but <laughs> that's why I quit. <laughs> They're that bad. That's why I quit. I think, Maybe me personally, I feel that like, um, I only been into two corporate America jobs and they were just so big that they were not taking appreciation of the little things that I would, like they would point out as soon as something goes wrong, but they would never pat my shoulder if something goes right. And I don't know if it happens in big corporations or, or because when you have a small team, you can talk it out and you can work with it and you can deal with it. But I remember, like I was like, wow, I did so much, and nobody came to me and said, great job, you know, thank you, or nothing. Like, I, wouldn't, I wasn't even uh, acknowledged, but as soon as something went wrong, I was like, ready to like, you know. And I think um, one particular situation, I was working in one of the brands, a big brand, and one of my colleagues uh, purchased a bunch of stuff from the store, but it was Christmas, she was leaving, and she came to the door and she waved at me, and she said, can you give me a box? because she wanted to wrap her Christmas gift that she bought her, right? So I grabbed the box from the store and I passed it to her at the door and they saw it in the camera and they almost fired me because I did that. And I was like... Because they didn't think it was a customer? No, or because it's not um, protocol. Like, if geez. you're an employee and you're making a purchase, you have to go all the way to the back door and you have to... Employee gets treated differently with the purchase and customer. 
But I wasn't thinking. She just said, oh my God, I bought all of these and I got to go Christmas wrap. And she used the front door and she said, pass me a box. I was like, sure, you work here. I mean, <laughs> you bought all this. So those, that's the situation. And it can happen, you know, but I think that like, that's why I'm pro small company, you know, like where if something happened, you can go with your colleague, you can sit down and talk about it, or you can, you know, take it back or whatever. But I, I got in trouble for that. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, as a woman and a minority, uh, being a CEO and having a business in the United States, has that ever been more difficult or has had to face problems you haven't thought about? Um, it's a combination of both. I have given opportunity for being a minority. So I, I didn't took some of the opportunity, like you can apply for like certain loans or things. So that was great. When, what I have challenged is only when I had my Motorbox business, which is, it was uh, data driven, and we were trying to raise funds via venture capitalist. And at that time, the venture capitalist, it was all male. And I, when I get nervous, my English started being like so crumbled and broken. And like I would do presentation and I would shake myself and like not be able to express myself, the vision of my company on the language that they, on the first language that they're listening to. So I would struggle a lot and I would struggle internally. Like I can't like like I would say to myself, I can't do this because my English is not like clear and I can't do this presentation and I'm a, I'm a room of thirty men that like they're the one that's gonna write me the check. I so that happened, but I think it happens because it's me trying to fight my own battle and me trying to overcome that. But also, there's a lot of opportunities, you know. Like I, I was, I, I was highlighted a lot in press because of my story, because of my background. Somebody will say, like Entrepreneur Magazine will say, I want to write a story about you. I want to interview you, and I would not have got the opportunity if I wasn't who I was, a minority woman. In business. That's a really, uh, I like, I like that way. Yeah, so love the art. Yeah, it's it's it's, <laughs> it's uh, half and half. You know, it's depends yeah. how you what situation you are in and what you try to accomplish. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's his hand. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I love your story, and I also love uh, handcuffs and the traditional culture. So in future, I also want to start my business, my company, mm -hmm. let people know my culture. Mm -hmm. So I wonder to know uh, what was the biggest challenge you faced in your startup early days and how did you solve it? To, to, to portray the product from the culture, to try to, to show, is that what the last question? I'm the last sorry, question? Yeah, uh, uh, what was the biggest challenge you faced in, uh, uh, in startups early days? Oh, in the early days? Yeah. The biggest challenges, yeah. So, you know, like we wanted to create a brand that is about storytelling and c gathering content. It's one of the hardest things. Be creative about gathering content. You know, like for example, like you talk culture. Like you like how could you how could you show the person that's buying the culture of the person that's making and what it makes that the item so special and how they make it and what's the story behind. And that's really challenging translating it into images sometimes or text. So video is the best way to go, but it could get expensive, right? Like I, you know, I want to travel there, hire a camera person, and then translate the content and all of that as well. But it is is the most one of the most powerful things that you could do if you can break, if you can, when you start your brand, you can hire a good videographer and 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 sketch out your story of your product and be able to to to, to show that it's a lot better than having to look a picture and reading a text. So that's my challenging budget to do a lot of videos. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can I answer your question? Yeah. I was gonna ask like other than social media, like what other forms of marketing do you use? There's Pinterest that we did really well. Um, which is social media as well. <laughs> but uh, we 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 actually rely a lot on SEO uh, with keywords because when sustainability became like a buzzword, everybody started paying on like sustain like the word sustainable. And like you say, a lot of people come and talk about sustainability, about being green, but not about people or economic changes. And we use, uh, we write articles or tactics that could, could, can trigger that, that 
board or that search engine. You said articles? Uh, sometimes we do like a backlink articles, oh, okay. you know, things like that, or like blogs, or, and then if you search certain things that is relatable to those, it will come up. So we rely on that um, a lot, and then, you know, obviously, a thing for us is just being also like the business that we didn't expect, which is the boutique. You know, it's, it's like I would like somebody emailing us say, "Oh, I saw you back in the museum of which 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 what <laughs> things like that." You know, and um, for for our product, it's so important for the people to touch it too because it's just so unique. And sometimes it's like it looks great on picture, but people want to touch it and see it. So, mm -hmm. believe it or not, trying to sell online is also you know could be yeah. When you started your wholesale business, or like when it kind of, it sounds like it sort of started organically, mm -hmm. do you actually attend any trade shows? No. Like that? No, so it's completely word of mouth how you've sold. It's been, it's been the platform that we use, which yeah. is like a wholesale platform for sustainable brands. Okay. Um, and like, you know, like I said, the buyers are very specific of what I want to carry. Like yeah. they're very like, I'm curating for my store, so this is what I want. Mm -hmm. Like you can, you can throw me product in my face, I don't care because this is what I want. Yeah. And that's a different type of buyer. Yeah. So because of that, it's been it's been organic like that. I know some. I know my other fellow entrepreneur friends that are on fashion line and do trade show. It's really expensive. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have the return on investment on time. Like yeah. you, you do trade shows when you're like five years in, uh -huh. when you're ready to take like no strong, you know. Yeah. Not like in your first year. It's just waste of money in your first year. When did you actually launch the site? What? Day, because this idea came about in March, two years. March, two years. Two years. Okay. So. I saw him. Yes. Hi, Jess. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. How are uh, you? I wanted to say uh, thank you so much for being here. I I love to hear about you and your study. I am Argentinian too. Oh, hola. hola. <laughs> <laughs> and I know how hard it is like moving from Argentina to here, mm -hmm. uh, breaking all language barrier and how difficult it is mm -hmm. for, for a lot of people, uh, for me, it was mm -hmm. very difficult. So, uh, and I'm in fashion design, mm -hmm. and I want to start my own business mm -hmm. in fashion apparel. So I was wondering, uh, how do you find uh, a right investors, and how do you know if a person would be good or not for your business? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how, do you have any recipe that maybe uh, <coughs> Yeah, um, so I, on my business model box, I was hunting for investor. <laughs> and this is one thing that I did wrong, and I hope you guys can take away from this, is I will wake up every day, and my sole job is to find an investor, but not to build my business. And that's what it burned me, because I'm like, I'm not building a business, I'm building a company that needs, that needs oxygen to survive from outside. Like, in order for me to survive this business, I have to get money from an investor. And that's part of also learning lessons that it happened. So if you start with that mentality, it's gonna be really hard because you have to invest first and then every, and then somebody will see it. And I know maybe when you say invest first, it's not gonna be money, it could be your entire time Sweat, yeah. <laughs> to show that you did this or you could do this or you could do better or everything. Like, Look what I, I did so little of what, what I had and look how much I did. And that's the type of investment they can see. Um, I think the easiest investment, we call it angel investor. And the angel investor is the initial investor. And usually, most of the time, it's close friends and family. Unfortunately, I didn't have that. Okay. All my family were poor. <laughs> um, your second uh, investor will be like a, a financial institution or a, a VC. But also now and day, there's so many different loans that help entrepreneur. So my advice is if as soon as you started, I mean, I don't know if you could build your credit and then take a small loan from the bank, you know, and then take it from there. Another thing that too, that the bank will lend you money if you have sales. So for example, when we opened the store, I we got a big loan because they give us the loan based on our sales. So. If you just started very small, let's say, if you have your line and you say maybe you put your line in small boutiques or like friends, friends buy or family or somebody buy, you have enough sales just to prove that you sold something, the bank will give you a bridge loan to get you to the next step. And then as you grow a little bit, the investor will come in. You know, I, a lot of the investors, they're coming in because they want to see money returning 
or because they trust, they believe in your vision. So those are the two types of investor you'll see. And the angel investor is probably like your first batch, where even if it's not family, it could be friends, or could be people that really truly admire your collection. Um, how, where to find them? <laughs> Network like crazy. <laughs> that becomes your full-time job, find an investor. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, well, welcome to America. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Is this your first semester or second semester here? Mine? Yeah. Uh, no, it's uh, seven. Oh, seven. Oh, okay. I am already For some reason, I thought you were doing one here. Close what? graduation. Yeah. Uh, but still, English has been my whole challenge in this country and everything. Uh, so when I started FIT, I didn't speak English uh -huh. as much. Yes. So everything was hard. Yeah. And I'm very good. Making yeah. stuff, but it was. Well, difficult. you're amazing at English now. Yeah, saying. you're speaking mm -hmm. clear. Yeah. yeah. Well, whatever you do, don't start new business in Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> Where else? I thought I saw another hand. Closer in. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This is amazing. You're welcome. I hope I was able to, you know, share some of that experience and feedback a little bit. And not make it all about me. <laughs> yeah, no, you <laughs> <laughs>